Hi, everyone. Sean Paul Ellis here from the Saturday Morning Cartoons Podcast. Remember, that's morning with you. Let's get into it. Pre-show announcements time. Will I make them quick? Will this take forever? We have shout outs, what's happening over the next couple months, and then what's happening today. So some shout outs from YouTube on episode 83 for Hey Arnold. During that, we had uh, Carson A. He says, the Christmas special where Arnold decides to find Mr. Wynn's daughter that is literally a war refugee, and Arnold does it because he got Mr. Wynn for Secret Santa. It's definitely in sp- or a special episode. Carson, I agree with you. I actually started watching this this morning. It is a great episode. It is very sad. Uh, it's very emotional, but it's an excellent Hey Arnold episode to check out. So definitely look for that Christmas special with Mr. Wynn looking for Mr. Wynn's daughter. It's awesome. Highly recommend it. On episode 202 for The Last Man, we have Warbear. He messages and says, just about every Steven Universe fan I met hate Last Man so much for the lack of inclusion and not care about the story. I guess I'm going to vehemently disagree with you on this, War Bear. I'm going to do it respect- respectfully, uh, respectively and respectfully. <laughs> uh, I love Steven Universe, and I also love Last Man. I think it's really sort of an apples to oranges comparison. I think it's a challenge to, to put these two in the same bucket. I think both have, you know, uh, interesting characters. Um, both of them have very interesting different stories. So uh, I love both of them really the same. Both of them are also worth checking out. I highly recommend both cartoons. So thank you, Warbear. Appreciate your comment. Episode 16, Tiger Shark. This is getting real old. We have somebody named Get Real. He messages us and says, I'm a little upset that I haven't found this channel until now. Well, get real. Get ready. Because you've got a lot of episodes to go before you get caught up, friend. There is a lot of content there. And if you're thinking to yourself, man, it sounds like they are recording in a tin can on episode 16. It eventually gets a lot better. Trust me when I say this, the recording process gets a lot better. You can probably hear us in newer episodes with a lot more clarity. So thank you. We're glad that you found us now, Get Real. Much appreciated. So the next couple months, we are going to be going through listener appreciation and your suggestions. We're going to keep doing this, these listener recommendations, until we run out of them. So ask yourself, in the 233 episodes, have we watched your favorite cartoon? If yes, then revel in the fact that we have your back already and we've also read your mind, if that's even possible. If no, then go on social media. Click the link, submit your suggestion. You can also always call us, 202-681-4406. Don't worry about writing it down. It's in the show notes. If you do this and you leave us a message, it ensures that you get the proper shout out for your cartoon and we'll include that snippet in the message. The bonus is, is that if you call we will 100% review your cartoon. I know, it's a little scary to leave a voice message, but we've had a lot of people do it. It's been super successful, so thank you guys so much for doing this. What are we actually talking about today? What the heck are we talking about? Oh my gosh, it's Mother Goose and Grimm. Guess what? It's a listener suggestion from our buddy EJ, who has been a longtime listener and friend of the show, so I'm very excited about this. To discuss Mother Goose and Grimm, I'm bringing back Joe Randazzo and Chris Ulrich. They are two close friends of mine, and we pick apart fables, fairy tales, parables, and maybe, just maybe, you might even learn something. Or as Joe says about himself, I'm very smart. All of this and more. So now, on with the show. Hello, and welcome to Saturday Morning Cartoons, the podcast that revisits, reviews, and ridicules some of the world's weirdest animated shows. There was an old podcast host who lived in a shoe. It's me! I'm your host, John Paul Ellis, and joining me today, he'll huff, he'll puff, and he will blow this whole podcast down. We have DC-based performer Joe Randazzo. Welcome back, Joe. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And also joining us today banished to a tower by an evil witch where he spends his days with his long, luxurious locks of golden hair. We have DC-based performer returning again, Chris Ulrich. Welcome back, Chris. Hey, Sean. Thanks for having me back. Oh, man. Who's that guy? Oh, it's Joe. (coughs) Got it. I thought it was my witch who lives in the house. Jesus Christ. (laughs) She's out tonight. She's out with friends. She's at a book club. Stop. (laughs) (laughs) 
I love the fact that this is going to be <sighs> over an hour of us joking and and just Joe just going, oh, okay. <laughs> If you are ready for the deep sighing episode that we've been promising everybody for so long, tonight is the night. Get ready. I'll uh, I'll count the eye rolls. Perfect. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. If you are tuning in and you didn't see the title of this week's episode and you have no idea what we're talking about, we are talking about the cartoon Mother Goose and Grimm. And to sort of set a baseline to kind of come to an understanding of where we are with this cartoon kind of wanted to just check in. Chris, what was your experience with Mother Goose and Grimm? Did you know that this existed? Did you ever watch this show? Uh, never. Uh, I was 21 years old when this show was uh, in existence, I believe. So uh, by the time this show was happening, my first knowledge of it is when you sent it to me to look at it. You, it you believe this show you is from t- the 60s? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, Joe. Yeah, no problem. Uh, here's your hat. <laughs> yeah. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Um, what's your hurry? I'll see ya. Uh, I, I, so no no exposure and experience. Not, not a lick. Not, not a lick <laughs> of exposure. Was that, was that like an intentional dog pun? Uh, I guess it was. Yeah. Yeah. Look that's at right. That. Look at that. Mm. Insta dogs. Hashtag Insta dogs. Oh, Check it you out. have been big on the Insta dog kick. Oh, lately. can't get enough of it. Actually. What is what is Insta dog? Uh, hashtag uh, Insta underscore. Oh, you talk about your fucking Instagram account again? Not mine. <laughs> just people and their dogs. That's eye yeah. roll number two. No, it's more than that. <laughs> <laughs> I just am obsessed with it. I can't get enough of it. Oh no, they're pretty great. And you and you never read the comic strip either. Like when it was in the. the you know, comic. I think I looked at it a couple times because when you mentioned there was a comic strip, I realized those were the same two comics. Okay. Yeah. If I'm hearing you correctly, maybe a little bit of exposure to just the comic strip. Yes. That's it. Okay. Great. Joe, what was your experience with Mother Goose and Grimm? Uh, so I had, it's one of those where you're like, oh, I've seen this before. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, uh, but I think I blocked it out. Like, I, I kind of think I, <laughs> like I lumped it in. Most of your childhood. In. Yeah. I, in the orphanage. Um, <laughs> I like lumped it in kind of like with Garfield, I think. Yeah. No, you're not wrong to do that. Yeah. And we'll Garfield talk, we'll and talk Heathcliff. About that. Um, yes. I remember it. And I was like, oh, I remember this being really funny. Uh, and then I rewatched it and, uh, we'll get to it. Uh, but I definitely, uh, I definitely read the comic strip very much. So I even had those like books, like where they had the, you know, like, yeah, like, like the, the, com- yeah. like the, com- the, the, the omnibus. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The little everything. small like trade paperbacks that like, you got at like the Scholastic you. Book Fair. The, the what? The Scholastic Book Fair. Okay. I heard you. I heard something else. Oh no. I made up a word okay. before. So what was the other word you made up? Scholastic. Scholastic. I just kept going with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is that somebody who reads and has scoliosis? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Scholastic. Jesus. They got Christ. nothing else to do. They can't play sports. <laughs> so I'm just saying. It's a horrible disease. Go on. Oh, my God. So a little bit more exposure. Yes. I would say I had seen the show and I definitely read the books, but I don't remember much about it. Then I'm actually in the same boat as Joe. I knew that this existed. I knew that I had definitely watched a couple episodes of it. Uh, and I was familiar with the comic book. I used to love scholastic book fairs for Calvin and Hobbes, the Garfield compendiums that they would put out. Anything that was a compilation of... Sunday morning cartoons uh, from the from the paper. I just loved those things. Those were always fantastic. And so uh, this kind of fell into that wheelhouse. But again, it was really one of those things that like looking back on it and watching the show tonight, I really can't remember anything. I have almost no frame of reference for this. Right. Other than just kind of understanding and remembering that it existed. Yeah, and I kind of don't remember if I like remember that it existed because I was such a big fan of the cart, the comic. And I was like, oh, I know these characters. Or if it was just because of the, like, because of the actual cartoon that seeped in. Right. Yeah. So. And it's hard because this, this really becomes like one of those, you know, what came first, chicken or the egg situations where, you know, because you have a longstanding comic strip that then parlays into a cartoon. And this cartoon was very short lived. Right. Yeah. And so it, it becomes one of those things where, you know, if you caught it in 91 in that sweet spot of like Saturday morning cartoons, this could very easily kind of, you know, have usurped the comic strip itself. But the comic strip may have been sort of the segue into to watching it. It may have kind of been what led you in that direction. Right. Uh, Chris? I was just thinking about just uh, related and unrelated, um, like the 
I knew it was short lived. And like, what's the average length of a cartoon in in general? Like, is it similar to like a range of could be like a sitcom in terms of like seasons? Or uh, and I'm just curious. You know, it always depends, and that's it's always a challenge. Like, you know, you you know, we only got 13 episodes uh, for this. Cartoon does have a syndication. Um, which is 65 episodes. Right, just like a show then. And so you'll, you'll find some cartoons that have one season, 65 episodes. Oh, wow. And by the end of it, they're really squeezing blood from a stone. Right. There are a lot of those recap episodes or you see ones where they're like splicing in. Like Turtles is like that. Turtles does that a bunch too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, original Voltron does Teenage that a bunch. Teenage Turtles. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, cartoons cartoons will do that. So they they tend to have that. But then, you know, you get cartoons that you know, may only go, you know, a couple episodes and then they kind of just cancel it right away. Right. Most notably Pirates of Dark Water, you know, only went. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It only went like a handful of episodes and then they canceled it. And it's one of those things where it's like it was such a compelling, interesting story. And a lot of people have said, like, why can't we bring that back? Like we're at a day and age where people can have passion projects, Yeah, you know, but, you know, the challenging thing for a lot of these cartoons was that it was to sell a toy. And so if a toy wasn't selling well, if it wasn't really kind of pushing it in that direction, people were like, I don't see the market viability for it. Let's just not do it. You know, so that's the challenge. So there's no prescribed number or average. I guess maybe it would be interesting to go back and take a look yeah, over curious. all the cartoons, all 233 episodes that we've had so far and just say, you know, what was the average, you know, for, for everything? Huh. So I'm going to throw that task over to you, Ulrich. <laughs> I'm, so, on, I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Joe, you'll do the research on that. Give yeah. me back to me with the data yeah. on it. Get Joe's, it Joe's nod, it. just like, yeah, you're not going to do that, Chris. I, <laughs> I know you. and He's not going to do any of that. No. <laughs> uh, I might. You never know. Well, kind of in reminiscing about this, we actually, this comes from a listener recommendation. So we have done listener recommendations for the last couple months. We are going to continue to do listener recommendations. We know that Two weeks ago, we did Alvin and the Chipmunks. That was really a for me episode. Oh, but we've had a lot of that. people who have reached out saying that, you know, that was a big part of their childhood, something that they cared about. And so uh, I'll always encourage people to go on our social media and recommend or refer cartoons to us through that method. That way I can just capture all of the information that you have. Awesome. Like listener EJ, who had originally actually said similar to us, he had the collection of the comic strips and it was very nostalgic for him. Well, I actually reached out to EJ the other day and I said that we were going to be reviewing this and he said, oh man, I haven't seen it in years. There are a couple of things though. During the intro when the vacuum cleaner eats Grimmy and he proceeds to explode out of the bag, I always associated it with the chest burster from the Alien movies. This show, in my mind, was very much along the same lines as Garfield and Friends, which I also love. In fact, eight-year-old EJ liked it so much that he purchased the comic collection in paperback form from a scholastic book order. Hey, I didn't even read that. Bringing it all the way back. Mm. Don't worry about it. Go so, EJ. Yeah, so absolutely. So thank Star. you. EJ has been an awesome listener and is always on Twitter uh, talking with us about everything. So I'm very excited to actually uh, kind of give him the proper shout out that he deserves from being a longtime listener. So uh, EJ, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you, buddy. Is it called the chest barster at that point? Like, does the face hugger become the chest barster? That's correct. Oh, it does. Yeah. All right. And yeah. then becomes the xenomorph. Okay. That's sort of like the life cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wasn't sure if it turned it, the name changed, but it does. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Mother Goose and Grimm, let's get into a little bit of history. This is, of course, as we've mentioned, this is based on the Mike Peters comic strip, Mother Goose and Grimm, which is also sometimes referred to as just Grimmy. It premiered on CBS mm -hmm. as a Saturday morning cartoon in 1991, Mother Goose and Grimm, which was then, as I had mentioned, renamed Grimmy in its very short and final second season. It was produced by Bob Curtis and writer Mark Evaner. It was uh, produced in association with Tribune Media Services, Lee Mendelssohn Productions, Film Roman, and MGM Television. And if any of those names sound familiar to you at all, one way to listen to a lot of episodes that we've had uh, on this cartoon, and we've already talked about the fact that, hey, it seems like there's a lot of Garfield and Friend references. That's because these production companies also made Garfield and Friends. Oh, cool. Which Garfield and Friends then, for Chris and his knowledge, that went on for like eight something seasons. Like there right. were tons of episodes. That of Garfield I saw. And, Friends. and I think some of the characters crossed over, didn't they? Or the pigs? Like the the style is super similar. It's very similar. Yeah, yeah. And we yeah. can definitely talk about that because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff that they had because there was the whole U.S. Acres portion 
that they had for Garfield and Friends. That was sort of the and Friends portion. Yes. Yes. That's right. So uh, it featured early animation works by Steven Hillenberg, who actually then went on to work at Nickelodeon for hit cartoons like Rocco's Modern Life and then later created SpongeBob SquarePants. And as we had mentioned, two seasons, a total of only 13 episodes. If you were to ask me, how do they break down those two seasons over 13 episodes? I have no idea. It's, it seems yeah, I, like maybe they came back for like two or three episodes in the, in the end. Very weird. Suffice it to say, the show ran from September 14th of 1991 until sometime in 1992 before ending. So that is the information that we have just to kind of give you a little bit of a glimpse of the, the history for this show and kind of where it came from and the people involved. But to give you sort of some of the plot synopsis, the plot synopsis is very short. It's very super simple. In fact, it's hilarious that IMDb just says it's a crazy fairy tale uh, filled misadventure of a mutt named Grimmy who lives with a fairy tale writer, Mother Goose and Attila the Cat. If you're not familiar with sort of the difference between Mother Goose and Brothers Grimm in terms of those specific stories, Joe and Chris are going to help us out. Joe, I think you're going to kind of fill us in a little bit on Mother Goose. Sure. So uh, Mother Goose, the figure of Mother Goose, is the imaginary author of a collection of French fairy tales and later English nursery rhymes. As a character, she appeared in a song, the first stanza of which now functions as a nursery rhyme. Uh, Mother Goose's name was identified with English collection of stories and nursery rhymes popularized in the 17th century, uh, where English readers would already have been familiar with Mother Hubbard, kind of a stock figure, uh, when Edmund Spencer published the satirical Mother Hubbard's Tale in 1590. Chris, you remember. Uh, (laughs) Old Mother Hubbard had a nursery rhyme publication titled The Comic Adventures of Old Mother Hubbard and Her Dog, uh, notable stories include Sleeping Beauty and Puss in Boots. Absolutely. There's nothing to be nervous about. You did really well with that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I've been working on my pronunciations. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> Chris, you're going to help us out a little bit it. with Grimm. Grimm's fa- Fairy Tales is a collection of... <laughs> we talked that over again. Take two of Chris reading this. Uh, Grimm's Fairy Tales is a collection of fairy tales by the Grimm brothers, or Brothers Grimm, Jacob, and Wilhelm, first published on December 20th, 1812 which contained 86 stories. This guy still owe me money from my run-in with them. We were playing craps in the back of the pub. No, uh, notable stories include Cinderella, Hansel and Gretel, and Rapunzel. So much of these shows are, you know, uh, kind of ingrained in our childlike minds, and then we grow into adults. It, it's so crazy to say that so many of these stories that we heard, whether they're fairy tales from Mother Goose, you know, whether it's something from, you know, Brothers Grimm, sort of getting some of these fables and fairy tales that we have, like, this becomes kind of like a part of our childhood as well. And so we're going to get a chance to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and I think I think Disney's got a really big hand in all that as yes, well. Yes, so, of course. Yeah, we'll get there. Yeah. You know, what's so cool is if you think back, 1590, you know, like what was the podcast people were doing in 1590? It was just around, stories. Right, yeah. yeah. It's so yeah, cool to us. think that this has been going on for so long. A little longer then, than that, probably. Pod, hold on, Joe. Do you, Chris, do you think podcasts has been going on since 1590? <laughs> no, I mean the idea of... stupid. Pe- they didn't uh, have talk- Wi-Fi back then. Well, I mean that you knew of, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> in the alternative universe I live in, there was Wi-Fi. You both got, it, two, you got two serious eye rolls for that content. <laughs> 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 I was just thinking about like this, the, the concept of the story and how it's continued to evolve. Of course. To the point where it is today. It's just so cool. And, you know, in Joe's point that he was talking about when he was reading about the the comic adventures of Old Mother Hubbard and her dog, you know, obviously the idea of Old Mother Hubbard lived in a shoe. Cupboard. Was it cupboard? The old lady, little old lady lived in a shoe. Old Mother Hubbard lived in a cupboard and she had no food for her dog. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, good to know. Yeah. So that being in mind, I haven't retained any of these stories from when I was a kid. Yeah. I don't even remember being a kid. It's funny when I when, <laughs> when I first became a dad, I was like, they're like, oh, you know, let's let me tell you a story, and it's just like I like I you confuse the like the endings to stuff, and you're just like, and then they murdered everybody, and you're like, no, that's not the ending I wanted there. <laughs> like, and some of these stories are horrific. Like what we ended you up reading re- to them. Yeah, do you rewrite the Shadow? <laughs> That's a true story. Why don't you read them to Raven while you're yeah. at it? I read The Shadow. <laughs> because when they're babies, <laughs> when they're babies, you can read them anything. As It's just the act of reading that, you know, whatever. So I would just read them whatever novel I was reading. So years from now, when they're in therapy and they're trying to track yeah, they're gonna their try and traumas. Out, 
what <laughs> Lamont Jordan is doing in their in their nightmares. Uh, Every now and then they hear the doorbell. They're just going to be rocking back and yeah. forth going, never more, never more. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so parenting's going well. Yeah, it's going great. <laughs> no, like, all right. So you look at services right now. Go you ahead, look at, uh, what's the one? Um, with the baby in the crib and the baby falls out of the crib, like uh, oh, Rockabye Baby. Services? Rockabye, Rockabye Baby. baby yeah. Sorry, right? I'll hold. Yeah. Rockabye Baby has a horrific ending. Like the baby and the tree both come down. Like, so we, what we do there is we just go, uh, down will come baby. Uh, everybody was safe. Like that's how we end the sh- <laughs> we end like Ragaba and the, that's how cradle we end it. and everyone was cradle safe. and and everyone everybody happy ever after we just change it because who gives a shit wow so, yeah he's not gonna do you it. feel any guilt about losing the original no version of the story? no I mean because if you look at the original version of all of these stories they are horrific yeah especially the grim fairy tales they are right like yeah, right. they're all like bondage and S M and like old ladies in barrels and, and, the, and like the hero one minute is the anti-hero and the hero you know it's wild and 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 to the point you know these are these are all written and these are all told as parables you know it, it, there's always some like type of a lesson to to be learned you know even with the uh, little red riding hood yeah, you know, it's don't trust anybody. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, Little Red Riding Hood is a sex is a sex allegory. Is that where you were going? I wasn't. But oh, go on then. No, I was going to simply say thanks for having me. <laughs> sure. uh-huh. It is. It is. Joe, your really? your Uber it's, is here. So, uh, uh, Little Red Riding Hood represents sure. innocence and femininity. Okay. And then the big bad wolf represents masculinity and sexuality. You know, like how easily she climbs into bed with him and kind of accepts like um like accepts that whole thing like you know Hmm. she sees that he is a monster but she still comes to bed with him you know and lays in bed and then she ends up in the original stories being devoured by him so if you look at it from that point of view it's a it's a total sex story wow so or at least a a parable about the dangers yeah so it's a great i I knew the innocence portion of it but just the whole like sexual innuendo and power yeah. portion of it is kind of did not know that yeah th- there's a really great um i don't want to plug other things but like there's a great show on uh on netflix called uh heroes and legends or myths and monsters myths and monsters and it basically takes you through like the origins of the fairy tales of hmm. some of the fairy tales um and kind of why they had them and the whole second episode is basically about these kind of the grimm's fairy tales and like what the woods represents and the woods actually in a lot of these uh represents wildness Wild. And like, just like the edge of civilization, but not only that, but it represents failure because um, the woods were always someplace you can go if you failed. Like if you couldn't mm. live a normal life, people just went and lived in the woods because you couldn't get kicked out of the woods. So like people who lived in the woods were essentially failures at society. We should note for everybody listening that we are podcasting out in the woods right now. Right. We are right. in the it's middle. True. We're in a clearing. We're in the Pine Barrens. <laughs> That's right. So I forgot, New the, Jersey. I forgot the matches. No. Oh, then we died. It's kind of why we're a failure. So, <laughs> kind of, but we're failing together. Yeah. So it's all failing right. together. No. <laughs> you can't, Chris. You know we don't have the we don't have the rights. We don't have the rights to. Oh my god! I'm pretty sure you covered under parody law or yeah. just shitty, shitty Parent. singing. Wow. <laughs> Tell it to the season and desist that we've gotten for the show. What all right. Show. Oh, sorry. Speaking of talking about music. We obviously have to enter into the discussion to talk a little bit more about the theme song for Mother Goose and Grimm. Uh, this theme song is very interesting and kind of to kick us off tonight, Chris, I wanted to turn it over to you. What were your what were your impressions? What did you like? What did you not like about this theme song? It's um I think it's reflecting in how annoying our lead character is. Okay. You know, um it was uh, being being Grimm the dog. Yeah, Grimm. And it's just like he's kind of got that energy and the energy uh, by the end of the theme song I don't know the visceral feeling of like Ugh, enough, you know. Um, uh, for me, it was just uh, and it was long, so I was like excited when it was over, you know. But uh, the song, because I uh, I love animals, right? So I'm not having not seen this. I was pumped to uh, k- uh, kick into like watching this. Uh, the dogs. Did you Grimmie. think it was a documentary about dogs? No, I didn't think it was a documentary about dogs. But I also thought that it was. Uh, uh, it was just kind of endless in terms of like, g- get it over with already. Let me jump into the cartoon. Okay. You know, because in the past, I can't think of the name of the one we, that Teen I watched. Wolf. Teen Wolf. 
It was faster. It was Again, Teen Wolf, not Teen, teen Wolf. Wolf. <laughs> this, this is a whole five minute sidebar to have with Chris again about this. There's an L in there. Um, teen Wolf. And, uh, but yeah, so I was, I was ready to get on with it by the time it was over. And okay. I'll, I will say that the, uh, the, the, I, was, I was curious like who was singing it. Okay. Know? Understood. So you the can, theme song is this like bluesy, like not even good blues. Like it's like this heavy, like yeah, girl, mother grooves and grim. And it's just, and I really enjoy the blues, uh, but that was fucking awful. And it just set the stage for like five minutes of pure hate. Like wow. I was like, it went into the hole quick and it doesn't really necessarily reflect the rest of the show. The rest of the show has this kind of like good hearted nature mm. to it. Um, but this was very much like he's being chased by everything and everybody. And it was just like, all right, let's like, I, I, I agree with Chris. It was just like, all right, let's get this over with. And just like this terrible, like bluesy, like abomination. I thought if they slowed it down a little bit, you know, I, maybe that would have helped it a little bit. Like, the, the blues version. It was very like, it was a harder blues version, but not, not good. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't yeah. know. Maybe it's the, the idea of like attention span trying to like, generate attention span well, i mean you know what eight-year-olds love is 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 blues music <laughs> <laughs> i would have been i think like 11 oh, trust just... me as an 11 or 12 year old watching this the oh, only yeah. thing i was like is put on more blues yeah, yeah it was like, it was oh not. man is that blind wi <laughs> blind willy <laughs> let's play it again <laughs> just me hanging out at a jukebox yeah, and just bro. pumping quarters into it being like let's get rocking john lee hooker play it again yeah, yeah, right. I, was thinking the same name. I, I thought for the theme song it was interesting because we obviously have dedicated animation and so they uh, for me that's always a hallmark of somebody gave a shit about this cartoon enough to say we are going to dedicate you know, somewhere between 30 uh, to, to 60 seconds the point. of dedicated animation for this. So for me, that comes in as like saying somebody's like, you know what, I care. I care about like what I'm creating, which is always a good sign. It's cool. We sort of get a little bit of a roll call. We don't get a visual roll call, like a title, like a quick screen that kind of says that person's name. But you don't get the, you don't get the full house effect where yeah, it's everybody exactly. smiling, right. opening mm -hmm. a fridge but, and then bribing their way into Stanford. Yeah. What? <laughs> It's very, <laughs> remaining very topical. With yes. This. Yeah. Uh, but you she know, had it, the grades. It, it, but you know, there, there was a part of this to Joe's point. I know we're laughing about it, but there was kind of like an intro to like a TGIF sitcom feel where it was like, you know, look at these people, look at the things that they're doing. And this is a thing that one of them obsesses about. And Oh, now we're going to get into it. He's a dog. And you're like, <laughs> all right. Okay. I get it. And, and you know, they keep, they keep referencing mother goose who is a literal female, like older woman goose. And we have Grimm that they keep talking about as a dog. So that's where you kind of get a little bit of the, like the roll call that they have. Again, to your point, like it's fun to hear it now, but it was also so muddled. And Chris, to your point, like if they would have slowed it down, maybe like a little bit, I kind of feel like I would have retained a little bit more. Like, maybe suck me in a little bit. It's because it's not an earworm of a song. No, it's a, you know it's an assault on your senses. Oh, there we go. So it's you know it, it's and I'll say like if you ever watch Curious George, like the the modern Curious George, only ever read it. Uh, they didn't have the medium of television because <laughs> he was actually the man in the yellow hat. Yeah. Just, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you watch mo the modern Curious George, which is kind of it, it's got this bluesy kind of almost skyy feel, like it's like everything. Curious, and it's like it's a blues, it's a bluesy song, but it's done so much better. It's more upbeat. It's like it's more tempoed. It's not as frenetic, and maybe, maybe it's because the the to Chris's point with the energy that it, that it let out it was just too much. So it was just an assault on the senses rather than like, hey, it's a rollicking good time. Question for you guys: you, uh, What's the hot, you know, cartoons in this time period? Right now? No, like, in the nineties. Oh, the like MC Hammer cartoon. <laughs> that's true really? yeah kind of but around that time though like what's it competing against and i'm wondering if like they're playing that kind of music because that's kind of the style of the time i mean it could have been you know I, i'm trying to think of and i i could probably rattle off an entire list of like 90s cartoons i mean you know you had 
I'm, I'm just thinking of like late 80s stuff. Like you had Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You had right. a lot of the uh, like Chippendales Rescue Rangers. Great show. Uh, which is an excellent show that, you know, you had a lot of stuff that was coming out during that time. And you were also getting to a point too with like that early to mid 90s where Fox was kind of coming in with a, a lot of stuff. Like there, we'll talk about sort of some of the parallels that we had in terms of this show versus some of the other ones. And, you know, I think Joe had already referenced, you know, uh, Heathcliff. Right. So, you know, a lot of like the animated, yeah. uh, you know, cartoons that they had. And Heathcliff too kind of had like a, you know, kind of like a cool kind of jazzy like, Heathcliff, you know. Heathcliff, Heathcliff, Heathcliff Yeah, exactly. About the neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. And so there were a lot of things that were going on in those cartoons at that exact time. And so it may have been indicative of like the early 90s, you know. But I, I want to say, and maybe it's always challenging because there's so few episodes and I feel like people do care about this cartoon. The sad thing is, is that it's not like any streaming service is saying, we'd like to put up the, you know, the the high definition remastered uh, version of this with like better audio. So as we're finding this on YouTube, there's like a considerable amount of static that's happening in the background that kind of detracts a little bit from it. So for me, it's kind of hard because I don't know if I was frustrated with the song because of the static that was there or just sort of the tempo and the pacing of the song, not really kind of matching up with, as Joe had mentioned, which I agree with, sort of the lighthearted energy of the rest of the episode. Right. Yeah, It seems to be a really stark contrast in terms of what was there. Now, you do get some of the personality of the characters that are there. Like, you sort of get right. the uh, the frantic nature of Grimm. You sort of have the, like, my understanding walking away was, like, I had kind of the calmer energy of the, the Mother Goose character. That kind of resonated. But then you get like a character like the dog catcher who has this like eerie Jason Voorhees feel to Yeah, him. like a Terminator kind yeah. of thing. Like yeah. always like, showing up. Like he just, right. he's there, he's not moving quick, but he just suddenly surprises you. Now we didn't see him in the episode that we watched for tonight, but you, you know that this is a character that's around right. who presumably shows up at some point. And it was it's weird it's, when he goes, Mom, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this becomes, is his obsession. Yeah. Or like when he's like, one, two, Freddy's coming for you. <laughs> yeah. like, I thought that was weird. Fuck? I thought that was weird. <laughs> it, was, it was very... Seems like a blatant copyright violation. Yeah. What parable or fairy tale was that? That would be a mother goose. I guess it would be. Because uh, one, two, pick up my shoe. That, that's, a, yeah. that's a mother goose era type like of English, rhyme. Yeah. In, English rhyme. And then, Fre you know, Freddy's coming for you. Right. Right. So, uh. Yeah. I will say that like the final very interesting thing that I noted is that this whole theme song begins with Mother Goose outside of her shoe and she's yelling for Grimmy. Grimmy. It starts that way and it also ends that way. Yeah. And so I thought that was kind of like a nice little button right. onto to everything. Like it's all in her mind. <laughs> like, Am I going too deep? No, you went too deep. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't think that this is all in her mind. I think that, you know, Grim is an actual Isn't it all like all real dog. Mind? Isn't it in all of our minds? Oh my God, Chris. <laughs> Well, I do want to talk a little bit about the animation because we've already sort of hinted about this and we've kind of talked around the idea and some of the parallels that you could draw, not only to Heathcliff, but also to Garfield and Friends. And so, Chris, uh, what was your impression of the animation for Mother Goose and Grimm? I liked it, you know, just in general. I mean, pretty uh, you know, baseline, but it, but in visually enjoying the cartoon. And I... Uh, I was obsessed. I wanted to know what the spider birthmark on Grimmy's nose is. You know, that big orange or yellow kind of thing he's got on his nose. I think that that's honestly just shading. Okay. I think it's like where a light point of exposure is because he has like, if he's facing the camera head on, he's got kind of like a, like a rounded, like he's got a very rounded, like black nose. Yeah. But then inside of the nose on one end, there's almost like it looks like a where a light flare would have hit it. Okay, that's uh, the idea. And it's kind of like a five pronged thing, kind of heading back. I it's got sort it. Of rounded. Okay. And so yeah, that's. Oh, okay. I think it's just supposed to be a way to to maybe show light. Yeah. Uh, or, or where it came through, because I, I don't think it looks like anything else. Right on. Yeah, and to, uh, and I don't know if you're looking for this, but just the textures, the colors, the character colors, like the the mob. He, you know that he wants to hang out with you know those other those guys and uh i just found it visually uh appealing you know, like i enjoyed it and i um i thought they were drawn well i i thought the backdrops were cool even the tree hides behind there's something about 
the the way stuff looked. I just enjoyed watching it. Now, what 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 was it particularly? Because I I had a similar impression as well. Well, that's a good question. I'm more of a feel. I don't know. It may, maybe it's the texture that were yeah. textures that were that's, used. That's what it was, right? And for me, and that, and you keep mentioning Ninja, or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? Yeah, Some say of those that again? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. There we go. Um, were um. Some of the textures of this reminded me of that. I definitely will say that uh, any time that you were looking at backgrounds in this show, there was almost kind of like a, a dirty texture that was added to a majority of it. So, like you know, I think there were a lot of scenes that we saw that were in uh, like back alleys yeah. or street corners or in urban settings. Yeah, it's urban. It's an urban show. Very and much. so there's a there's like a lot of uh, like the characters themselves don't have a ton of definition. Right. Uh, and they tend to be very solid primary colors. But then you look at the rest of the background and like everything that they're up against and it's very textured. There's a lot of like crosshatch marks that they have to kind of show what looks like dirt or like an implication of uh, like a dirty kind of feel to it. it. It seems like in many cases they spent way more time on the background textures than the they actual. did on the actual characters themselves sometimes. That's a great point because if you think about Grimmy's feet, you know, yeah, just like just really like little, like round, little nubbins, round nubbies, little round nubs. When he nubs around, you know, versus the the depth that goes back even to the like where he's chewing on the garbage and stuff. The depth <laughs> of stuff in the garbage cans is like insane. It's very weird. Uh, I thought it was kind of lazy. You know, like it's very indicative of like the late eighties, early nineties. Like it's got that like feeling to it. And it's fine. It's very nostalgic, but like it took you back to your time on the streets. Yeah, uh, hustling, <laughs> robbing and drugging people. Me and Cardi B. So um, I, I don't know. I didn't love it. Like I definitely, I maybe I've just been kind of spoiled by more modern cartoons where it's much cleaner and much more like nicer looking. But it, it was just, but I think they also, and it matched the style of the actual uh, cartoon from the the comic strip, which I think came out first. Yes. Um, so like, I think you kind of had to have that same kind of style there, which is just, you know, you're very basic. They're not putting a ton of work into, you know, the backgrounds of, uh, you know, a newspaper comic. So it was very, not lazy, lazy, but more like just not as defined as, as I, as I typically would like something. No, I gotcha. So, yeah. I, you know, it was really funny because, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of, you know, obviously Garfield and Friends. They had some of the same production companies. You talked a little bit about Heathcliff. Some of the other notable cartoons that I think that came out that were very animal focused, uh, that were around this time and then a little bit later were Eek Eek the, the cat. cat. Yeah, this and especially Attila. Yeah, uh, is very, very reminiscent of Eek, Eek the, the cat. cat. But Eek the Cat is like a heads and tails better show. It's a fantastic. Eat the cat did an apocalypse now episode. I, I'm not arguing like, with you. It's, yeah. It was wonderful. It's, yeah, it's very you know, it's a very different cartoon. Yeah, smarter, more Sounds, adult. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's really. I'd love good. to see that actually. Yeah, eat the cat's a good show. Yeah, uh, so or, as I remember. And then but, uh, you know the other one to kind of go along with the Grimmy idea is just Courage the Cowardly Dog. Yeah, you know, that because was on the, Cartoon the, Network. You know, the and the dog that was, is kind of a is a coward. Uh, roughly yeah, a little bit i mean he roughly. has he, he has moments his courage of, he has he has moments in this episode where he stands up yeah you know where he kind of you know makes makes big strides big bold choices i don't know uh, yeah i mean he's not he's not a total you know coward but like at one point he's like oh even i'm a coward you know he makes a coward his own cowardly joke right um because he's compared to the cat um who is even more bigger coward than he is but yeah, I mean, apparently there's, I, didn't, I don't remember the show enough. Does he have like an antagonistic relationship with birds? Like he's trying to murder birds a lot? I don't know, but we, we got into it a little bit. We're actually, we're now kind of transitioning into a lot of the okay. character stuff. And yeah. so that, that's a great point. You know, was, you know, Grim, Grimmy has this whole thing that he talks about with like, he wants to catch birds. There was this whole reference about like, you know, uh, can you tell me how to get to Sesame Street? Right, because he's trying yeah. to murder Big Bird. Yeah. Yeah, that's the best right. line in the yeah. show. <laughs> So uh, yeah, that being said, one. was there particularly Joe a character that like you identified that you liked that no. was in the cartoon? No, I didn't like, no. and and I, and I tell you, a lot of it has to come down to the voices. Okay, I didn't love the voices, like the Mother Goose um, voice, like it was very grim. Hey, why don't you do this? And it's like, stop! You need to stop. I like the cat. The cat was good. Okay, there was a cat that he goes into like this 
whatever he goes yeah. into this weird international like interracial relationship with oh that cat yeah yeah i mean no not attila yeah i didn't really like attila that much everybody oh, the kind female, of the female cat the female cat that doesn't talk a lot and then you had like the the tough she guy talks a lot she just says meow yeah you have the you have the typical tough guy who's like the bad guy and then yeah, but, oh no yeah. you know who i liked I, all right i'm sorry i there was somebody i liked when they do like the honeymooners for the ticks right i don't know if the ticks show up a lot yeah but they do like a basic like honey i'm home kind of honeymooners um parody about i'm gonna call my my mom to come and move in with us and and then he goes um oh what's the line there's something that's very sexist but hilarious something like um comes with tomatoes like where he refers to his wife as a tomato who that the mother-in-law comes along with and i was like oh that's actually pretty funny that the, those characters I actually like. I really like the the male flea. So that was, and I don't know if he shows up later on. I don't know. I'm not yeah, sure because that that plot comes out of nowhere and then goes nowhere. So um, <laughs> so I don't know if he's a reoccurring character and setting setting it up like that or what it was. But uh, I enjoyed the Ralph Cramden oh. flea. Right. And we should mention for everybody that we watched season one, episode one, which had two segments. One was called Puppy Love Story, and the other one is called Brotherhood of Ham. Chris, same question to you. Was there any particular character that we you had observed from both of these that you really liked? Same thing. I, I love the, I mean, not, well, the inception of the uh, the fleas, the whole village, that whole world, alter world, and how it's literally they are the kickstart that um, forces him to take a courageous act. You know, there's something about that that I, I liked a lot. Um, I got a kick out of the voice of the Attila, the cat. You know, oh, oh, you yeah, talk like this. Yeah, it's got a very Marvin, yeah. Martian. Yeah. Oh, Heavenly, it, made, no. it made me think of he- whoever the character was. That, Heavens to Megatron. That's, That's Marvin, Marvin Martian. Martian. Yeah. You should be yours. Yeah. <laughs> What, you just talked. Yeah, that. just said it. I don't think you just said that. I, I literally just said I think that. I said it and then you said it. Okay. You know, the weird thing is that I wish in this instance that we were recording what we had said so we could go back and check yeah. it out. Yeah. 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 If only someone listened to this. Podcasts, so, were, not, <laughs> podcasts were not invented. To be listened to. It's a live event. <laughs> it's a live event. <laughs> so the, the, I remember the joke as, as, as you were talking. The joke is the flea, uh, the, the two fleas, the, one, the, the wife flea wants to get a bigger house. And he's like, no, nah, we got plenty of room. He's like, oh, if we got plenty of room, then my mother-in-law will, can, my, my mother can come over. And the, the Ralph Cramden flea goes, mother-in-law. He goes, they're like seeds. He goes, you don't need them, but they come with the tomatoes anyway. Oh yeah, and I was just like, <laughs> oh right, yes, that was a funny line. <laughs> bravo, sir. <laughs> yeah, like, that's a it's a good line. The oh. uh, the characters uh, the, and then the classic tropes of like the bully dog and then the other dog being like, yeah, boss, yeah, you oh know? yeah, and the, everybody the, else trying to fit in into the kind of like, God, yeah, we had that's... Thor as like the main aggressor, and then I was it like Scramps, I think, is the other. <laughs> yeah, it was some shut up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was like the hench, yeah, boss, yeah. The, yeah, the henchman, character. like, kind of yes man that they had, which was super fun. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and Grammy, you know, her, uh, you know, she's fine. She's got that role in there. You know. Mother Goose? Mother Goose, yeah. yeah. Um, He's Grammy. He's Grammy. Like, very he? first name basis. Yeah, yeah. we're tight. Very, but, uh, yeah, very the cat, familial the cat, bond. Just the cat's says. voice. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, yeah, I'll leave it there. No, I mean, I, I, I agree, you know, that there were some definitely, some grading voices that they had that was on there, but I... I liked I liked the tail of the cat. I thought he was no, silly. Too. You know, I, I thought that. that was fun. It's very hard to say that, and in the same breath, be like, I didn't hear any of us say that we really loved the titular characters from Mother Goose and Grimm, <laughs> <laughs> which is always a challenging thing to go into. We've we've argued this point a lot on this show. Most recently, even this past December, when we were talking about, uh, you know, Pinocchio's cr- uh, Christmas that they had for the Rankin Bass special, we're just like. This would have been a better show had you gotten rid of the titular character. If Pinocchio wasn't in it, this would have been a fine program. I would have still enjoyed it. So it's always hard to think about and kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we kind of get more into these discussions. But I would I would have much prefer a show about the fleas. About the fleas? Yeah. Or, yeah. or like uh, kind of maybe the other shows going on, but it's like the rest of the show is the MacGuffin. Yeah. And those guys are the, yeah. you know. The but you know what I could just do instead is just go watch The Honeymooners. Like, I named my dog after Ralph Cramden. Did you? Yeah. What was his name? Ralph. Oh. He's a poodle. 
He didn't know he was a poodle. Right? What, did, what did you tell the dog it was? What? He didn't know or I didn't know? Who didn't know? The, you literally the, said, I didn't know it was a poodle. This just became no, like he an didn't Abbott know. and Costello he didn't know he, was a poodle. he didn't know he was a poodle? Because we would be like, Gug. He'd be like, Ralph, he's out there. He's out there. He's lurking. And he would get all fired up and then he'd go out. He'd open up the door and he'd blitz outside. To go was he a toy room. poodle? No, he was like a regular poodle. You know, they're, they're, most, they're, the, they're a hunting dog. You know that, right? Like poodles, poodles are, are hunting like dogs? super aggressive. They're the most aggressive type of dog. Well, a couple of times I had to pull him out of trees because he had climbed up in a tree. Yeah, dude. Did you not do any like research on the animal you I, owned? I was uh, four when we got him. Okay. So uh, my research But like in the, in the 60 years since, you didn't do any research on like- well, no. Tim Tim Berners-Lee hadn't created the internet until right. then. <laughs> No, no, they're shoot. You know, do you know why poodle, like especially toy poodles, are why they have like the weird fur? Tell me, Cliff Clavin. Uh, because, <laughs> because when they used to go hunting with those animals, um, they would go in the water a lot, and all their fur would get super wet. So they shaved off most of their fur, and they kept the fur in like the high areas where they needed fur, like in the joint areas. Yeah. To keep them warm, but everything else, it, it's so that they would dry off a lot faster. Hmm. So that's why those animals look like that. They're vicious dogs. Oh, I learn so much every time you're on this show. Thanks, I'm not. Sure. I'm not being like a jerk about it. No, like, no, it's, okay. it's always interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm smart. <laughs> I walked right into should that one. For, <laughs> should try out for Jeopardy or something. I like do that. every fucking time. I fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I do. No, man, you're gonna have your year <laughs> every time because it's. Uh, I have a whole theory, but go 2020 on. 2020 is the year of the Randazzo. Could be. It's the year of the Randazzo. The Randazzo. I'll, I'll get on after Alex Trebek passes. Oh, oh so. Jesus! Jesus dude. What? You just lost us. I just. I'm just not. Lost tr- the no, audience. I'm just being a fair a judge of time and, and hey, the disease. Good. Like. Dude. It's just true. It's true. I'm sorry. I really love the guy, but yeah. like, it's a bad situation. Right. I brought the whole show down. Wow. I mean, there's, there's, <laughs> no, Christ. there's no way to segue. Just fucking edit that yeah, part I'll out. I'll help you. Edit that part out. Start S- here. I'll say I that. I love the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll say this. We're obviously not going to go beat by beat for the plot tonight. I've put together a, a list of questions that are kind of related, that are inspired by sort of what we watched for the cartoon for this evening, based on these two different segments that we had for Mother Goose and Graham. And so, you know, in the puppy love story, uh, the whole topic is really sort of about the embarrassment and humiliation when it comes to dating. And so I wanted to kind of go around and Chris, start with you. Do you have an embarrassing story about asking somebody out on a date? I'm thinking about this. Uh, n- nothing pops into my head more so like, uh, in eighth grade, um, f- that first kiss moment was, uh, uh, just a absurdity, you know, like it was nervous seventh grade. I think it was, it was, it was a nervous wreck. It just keeps getting younger and younger. And, uh, it was seventh or eighth grade and we we're on a bus trip coming down to Washington, D.C. Picture Sicily, 1942. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, picture police blaring on the, uh, on the speakers of the, of the boom box. Back when they had those, and uh, and I was just a nervous wreck. I'll never forget it. My friend Sally was walking me through it. She was like, "Okay, Chris, you know, put your arm, but pretend like you're tired. Roll your arm back." Was Sally you walking you through? Sally, my gynecologist. Oh, what? Yeah. My she's my gynecologist today. Today? Yeah. In real life? Yeah, she's my bet one of my best friends. She became a gynecologist, so whenever we're out and about, I'll be you like, "You got to be my really friend. particular that she's not your gynecologist." No, not my gynecologist. Yeah, that's but I always that's introdu- how you phrased it. I, I didn't introduce even her as that. my gynecologist. I'll be like, "This is my gynecologist," because of that reaction, just for the laugh of oh it. Oh my god! So, wait, so hold on. I'm, I'm so. <laughs> all right, so your gynecologist is coaching you through. Was you making out with her? No. No, we were just like had a kind of. So step she, into she it. was a third wheel well, we're to on a your bus, make out. So there are many people uh, that were wheels. But on she's the bus. just like like up in your grill, being like, "No, do it." No, no. <laughs> she was like, "You got this. You got this." So you know. Did it work out? No, it didn't no, work out. This was like, I was too scared, you know, in that moment, okay. and it was like ultimately, you know, we were going to do it later, and then I got the flu d- during the trip, and I felt sick, and then. Uh, we went out, we started going together. We went out when we, the trip started and we broke up by the time the trip ended. Good. That was the full extent of my relationship. <laughs> Meant to be. Yeah. So, you know, it set uh, the early agenda. So okay. um, that was, uh, that's my moment of vulnerability. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Chris. I, I do appreciate it. Joe, <laughs> I don't know if I could top that winner, <laughs> but... <laughs> 
<laughs> what was the question with an awkward time yeah, did you, you have a, did you have an awkward moment yeah, awkward moment so, in dating so many i mean i used to date off a of craigslist so like <laughs> and this was two months ago yeah this was this was right before yeah. they shut it down uh, <laughs> But no, nah, I had so many. Like there were times where like I'd call a girl up and like leave a message on her phone, but then like forget to leave my phone number. So like then have to call back and like leave like two subsequent messages. And like, oh, there's one time like I just got my cell phone and like she, I forgot my number midway through and I was like, I gotta call you back and like hung up the phone. <laughs> was she on the phone? No, or? no. Who's leaving a message? This, these were messages. So oh. somewhere there's a message that's just like a total panicked like whole thing your rights coming yeah there was one time where do you remember pleasure place on georgetown no. it's a, it was a sex toy shop no it's a really cute girl who worked there uh and i ended up like going back and like trying to pick her up which is like borderline impossible um because obviously like everybody in there is trying to pick her up but like as i went in uh i was like what can i buy that says, hey, I'm available, but also, hey, I'm not a total, like, creep. Um, condoms? No, I ended up getting lube, actually, because it's like a multi-purpose. You could use it by yourself. You could use it with other people. Sure, or, sure. Yeah, the whole bit. Anyway, lovely girl. I ended up getting a date. Uh, and it didn't, With her? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I love about that, that you bought the lube, is that there's a lot of thought that went in to it, like this could be something you could use with others or others or yourself. Right. You know, and that was like as important to you as actually getting the date. Right. And, and it was, it was insane. Like that was like, it was, and she like took me around the store and like showed me all that. And like, I remember there was one point where, uh, how family friendly is this? Show? Not family friendly Good, at perfect. all. We've never done a single family. Friendly so episode. she showed me this, like had to be like a two and a half foot long double dildo, like a black dildo. And I was like, that is massive. Like, that's a huge, I mean, it had to be even longer. I was like three feet. And she's like, eh, I've seen bigger. And I was like, oh, I'm out of my league here. Bigger like, dildos? Yeah. Like, and I was just like, this is, I, and it was, I was so, it was batting so far out of my league. Like, this was like, like, I wasn't even in the MLB anymore. Like, I was like playing like youth <laughs> hockey. Like farm league. Like, I'm playing a different sport than this girl was. <laughs> uh, great girl, though. Hope she's doing all right. I will say that my vulnerable moment, very similar to Chris, took place on a bus. Uh, there was a girl in seventh grade that, you know, when you're sitting with a bunch of friends on the bus and, you know, it's just a bunch of guys back there and like you're all joking, making like fart sounds and, and giving each other punch bugs and stuff like that. Uh, a couple kids were just like, yo, you should totally go ask that girl out. And she lived maybe like a cul-de-sac away from me. And I was like, no, I'm not going to, not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And uh, like, you know, when it goes on like that for like two, three weeks, you're just like, maybe, maybe I will. Like, I don't have a, I don't have a girlfriend yet. Maybe, maybe it's How old were you? It's seventh grade. So, you know, like, it was like, that's like 16. A, what? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Chris got left back a lot. <laughs> yeah, but I crushed it in that last year. <laughs> <laughs> Junior <Bart>. varsity champ. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I finally like built it up in my head that like I should go ask this girl on a date. So uh, I'll never forget. I got off the bus at her stop, and I think because everybody had been like egging me on and like saying shit on the bus that she obviously heard, and she had to have known. She gets off the bus and she just kind of like, like clenches her backpack and just kind of like bolts towards her house. And I'm just like, hey, hey, can stop for a minute? And like she, she did. And I was like, hey, just I wanted to, to ask you out. I just wanted to know if you wanted to go out with me. And she's like, no. And she just like continued booking it. Well, that was very... So the follow up to this is that we were in senior year, we were in a like a like a comp writing class together. And uh, this is like five years later. Yeah, it was like five, six years later. And so uh, you're bringing your A game. No, no. She we had become close friends uh, and like there was no weirdness about that moment or that instance anyway. But she brought it up in class. And we were in like some poetry thing and she was like, wouldn't it be funny if we both wrote poems about what our experience was? And I was like, why would you do that to us? <laughs> and so then she's like, let's do it. And I was like, oh, game on. So we had been learning about like rhyming couplets 
<laughs> and so I wrote mine in like iambic pentameter. Like I wrote rhyming couplets for the whole fucking thing. And she, we came into class the next day and she got up and like hers was maybe like a paragraph. Like it wasn't like, there wasn't a lot of thought. It was just like, this is what happened. This is like, that was it done. And I like got up there and I had like th- like a three page oh, poem. Like, <laughs> There's a blue streak moment for you. There's an epiphany. Yeah, I think I think but like she used trauma. your name. Yeah, like yeah. was it was obvious like yeah. there once was a ginger named Sean. <laughs> like <laughs> no, he thought like, he had it going on. No, because Sean, like people Sean, people in class like our he teacher asked me out. Our and teacher, I said, no. Oh man, our teacher even like made a big deal. She's like, "Do you Sean?" Like, and I'm not going to out her name. Rebuttal. But they were like. <laughs> they were, <laughs> <laughs> no, she was just like, Sean, are you cool doing this as well? And I was like, yeah, I guess I'm on board. So like we stopped the class like in oh, a more, like, it was like a first period class. Good. She got up and delivered like, you know, like real early in the morning. This was like an 805. And then like, you know, 806, they were like, Sean rebuttal. And I was like, well, I hope we got the rest of the class planned because wow. here we go. I definitely felt like we walked away from it and she was like, does he still like me or not? And I, I just, it was so much water under the bridge at that point. It was just a fun story. So that's sweet, good. man. Yeah. Did you get a lot of flack from it? I, nobody said, no, I didn't get any flack from anybody. Oh, uh, you didn't know me. About it. Yeah. I did not know you. <laughs> had that, had that happened, I'm pretty sure Joe would have been there and he would just Door. been like, you going to wrap this up? <laughs> hey, you on? done with this? Are you yeah, going to marry her or what? <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, are you going to go out with this guy? I yeah, wouldn't. I just got ordained uh, over the time that it took you to read this dumb poem. Like, I you guys want to, want to solidify this? All right, Shakespeare, let's go. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, we talk a little bit about the fact that in this episode itself, there's the really the concept of opposites attract. And so I, just lightning round question, Chris, do you feel that opposites can attract? No, okay. I think there's an, uh, oh, it, no, go. I was just going to say, you know, there's actually um, studies out there that we love the myth, the idea of opposites attract, and sometimes they will just for like a passionate moments, but the, but the reality people partnering will partner with people that have a that have a similarity aspect to them. But, Something like people like people like themselves. Right. So there'd be elements that where it might be smart. But but this whole idea of that the media or the Hollywood has portrayed this idea of the opposites attracting. It's it's that Paul Abdul video. Yep. Yes. That, uh, yes, that quintessential nineties video, uh, which is the MC at this Scat point, Cat. It's the big yeah, the big uh, kind of like uh, probably the inspiration for the yeah. particular episode. Yeah. Joe. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think they do in some ways, I think, it, but for the most part, they're flings, like, it's just yeah. for fun, like, yeah. it's not, you know, uh, I, I feel like I couldn't go out with someone who was so polar opposite of me, because you don't have the same kind of value system, and I think that's right. what's really, like, the same, if you, and if you do have the same value system, then you're not that opposite. Right. Just saying, I, I'll, I'll, because mine is identical to what your comment is, it's, it's value system as well as also, uh, interests. You yeah, know, like, you know, it, it, it's one of those challenging things, like I'm very fortunate that my wife, uh, you know, that she loves to play video games. Right. You know, and so if if I was married to somebody who when I come home and like I'm playing a video game and she's like, what do, do we have like? do we have to do this right now? Like right. kind of be hard. To, yeah, it'd be very challenging. Like, yeah. you know, and the fact that like we can both watch each other play uh, is a huge plus. Like, I love being able to do that. I love being able to have that shared experience. And I mean, there are some things where you don't need to have that. Like, the best part is like, oh, I really like, you know, peppers and pickles and my wife doesn't. So when we have, we'll go out to eat, I'll eat hers and, you know, from yeah. her things. That, that's a nice little perk. But I think in general, if you don't have those same kind of shared interests, it's not going to last a long time. Yeah. Um, I mean, there is something to be said about the exotic uh, you know, and going out with somebody who is very different of a different yeah. culture or something like that. Um, I think there's also a lot to be learned in those instances too. Yeah, it's yeah. like, it's great. It's great to have that exposure. And you know, is it something where you can kind of find a common ground yeah. right, at that point? Um, like for example, I, I went out with this Japanese girl for a little while. Okay. No, no, don't use her name. Uh, and, uh, and she, uh, it was very difficult because, I, I actually went over to uh, Japan to be with... Will you I, shut I, up? <laughs> I remember you. Will you shut up? So uh, I went over to Japan uh, to be with her and it was very difficult because uh, we didn't have those same cultural milestones uh, to fall back on. And then sarcasm doesn't really translate well into Japanese. 
So uh, also, I wasn't speaking Japanese, so it got difficult at times. But it's you know one of those things. Yeah. Um, also, I think just very quickly to get back to the episode, uh, I think there was a little bit of a race issue here um, because the episode is all about how uh, they go, oh, Grim, do you want to, you, you got a girlfriend? And it was very much like, oh, you should have a girlfriend. You should have a girlfriend. And it's like, fine, I'll get a girlfriend. He's like, oh, that girl's so hot. Like, I want to go out with her. And then it turns out that it's a cat. Um, and he's very taken aback by that whole thing. It's kind of like a Bronx tale. Yeah, it's a little like a Bronx yeah, tale. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, and it's a cat, and he's like, I can't go out with a cat. Like, you know, everybody will make fun of me. And it was like all those, like it was societal norms that were right, really right, the issue. Right. Um, and then he's like, finally, he ends up. She is threatened, and he ends up protecting her, like a Bronx tale, right. I think. Although, and although in Bronx tale, he's he's more into it from the get go. He doesn't give. Yeah, a well, I mean, she's she's things. she's more good looking than the cat is. But like, um, <laughs> what well, I'm just saying. It's your alternative. It's different the, worlds. Yeah, it's different worlds. And then he ends up being like, you leave my girlfriend alone. And then he gets right. into a fight for her and stuff like that. But uh, so there's like this kind of like racism aspect to it uh, or speciesism that I thought was was interesting slash borderline insulting slash uh, a, a different take on the normal Insulting stuff. how? Like, uh, you know, if you're an eight, if, how, I don't know what, well, how? Well, the, the, just for the most of the episode, I can't go out with him because of, oh, right. of how people would perceive me. But, right. but not but, only, but not only that, just like the pressure that's applied to Grimmy in the beginning of yeah. saying, like, you got to get a girlfriend. Like, right. you got to get a girlfriend. Like, where's your girlfriend? Yeah, like, we got girlfriends. Yeah, you know, yeah, he's like, like lying. Like he's like, oh, I, I got plenty of girls. I got a ton of girls. Yeah, girls yeah. love me. Yeah. I, mean, I, you know, I got. It, it's such a, it's such a terrible like machismo. Like, it's such a terrible flex. Like, I don't oh. think you make that episode today. What? Well. I don't think you make that episode. No, today. absolutely not. You know, right? So you know, this is definitely one of those those things where, like, looking back on it, you're just like, yeah, there was some weird sexism, speciesism, yeah, machismo. I don't, I don't, like, I don't, I wasn't like, oh, this is a Me Too moment, but like, it was just like, this is right, this is touchy. Was the yeah. was the idea ultimately though to show that you know, listen, when I when I really think about it, I like this person for who they are. Yeah, it was. It ends up being a real love is love there. is love moment. Right. But like, but but the path there is messy is, and is, is questionable. Messy. Yeah. But I but I mean I I also feel like if as long as you get to that moment and show how you got to that moment, right. those kind of flaws can be forgiven because yeah. it's a character arc. Do you think they did that? I do. Yeah, I do same. think yeah, they do I that. I think that they hit the arc with this. Yeah, I think you hit the arc, and oh, I think that like you can show a flawed character. I mean, maybe we're going too deep into this, but you can show a flawed character um, redeemed and then that kind of character is flawed. Um, you know, and I didn't see Green Book, but apparently that kind of is is a similar, like a very like machizo Italian. There's 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 so much to unpack with Green Book. I didn't see it. I didn't see into. it. But no, like no, that's that's what I've what I've I like kind it. of understand is like this this very macho italian who's possibly a racist at the beginning he is. goes through this arc he's not pot not like maybe like he's definitely all right and and then goes through the arc and then there's there's been the argument is like is that okay and yeah and that that's the whole problem that they have with the, the concept and the idea of just what they've called like you know like a race fantasy or like a black fantasy of right. just like you put you know a white and a black person together in like the 50s you know and they're they're together for an extended period of time like it cures racism and it's right. like no it doesn't like, yeah it's still a systemic problem right you know all you did was show like a semi-positive story in one instance like but it's still a fantasy you can't right but cure it's not racism like that but way. it's also not like you don't have you know stories of straight racism like it's not like this is the only story we're you right. know highlighting you know for every green book there's um you know, a raisin in the sun or something like that, where it still shows like the, the very negative effects of racism right. or in the heat of the night is something like that. Right. Well, in the heat of the night is is more along the green book side, but anyway, we got too deep. No, we went no, too, no. we went too dark. So we'll pull it, we'll pull it back out and we'll kind of recenter. great show. <laughs> Jeopardy. Great show. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You just start right there. Oh man. So, I uh, I just again, very quick, just to kind of like tie this in to the second part of the episode that we had is that, uh, do you have a favorite fairy tale, Chris? I was I was thinking about this, and I'm sure uh, if I spent more time on it, others would pop into my head. But one of the ones that popped into my head is the um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Okay, you know it's kind of like you got a thing for short guys. What's that? What? <laughs> no, because it's like a precursor to the Lord of the Rings in a way. You know, like <laughs> the, 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 the it's the Fellowship, the oh Fellowship, right? And the oh Fellowship was like. 
you know, to me, it was like, <laughs> it was just this idea of the fellowship, right? And the Lord, you know, the fellowship. Just of the because ring. they're short. Like, no, it, no, it has nothing hobbits. to do with no, that. It's exactly no, it's exactly what a, it no, is. No, no, listen, you're taking this. Listen, All you right. know, if you're I feeling offended, deep. let me apologize. Oh, because I'm short. Okay. <laughs> so, so Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So, yeah, but let me just say that, like, that's the idea of that, what they're about, what they're trying to get to, to they're trying to serve uh, this, the goodness here, like the one true. The, you know, Ring, the queen, the rule right? Of them all. She's like, yeah. And if you serve that versus the, yeah. Meanwhile, you have the opposite. Everyone else is the evil queen, right? She's the, you know, the Saruman in this. The what? Okay. What? What'd you say? Saruman. 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 Okay. okay, Joe. Do you have a favorite fairy? Uh, Pinocchio, because they're Italian. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> all right. So, keeping that in mind, keeping that in mind, one of the. <laughs> One of the God damn it ran down. Right? All right. So in the second in the second part of the episode that we watched for tonight, Brotherhood of Ham. Now they they aim to ruin or or kind of a tweak a popular fairy tale it, right? uh, of the three little pigs by telling them that their homes were not zoned properly and that they would need to they would need to get rid of them. So they're kind of ruining it with uh, like an adult theme or an idea. And so based on Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Uh, I want to ask you, how would you dwarf. introduce you like dwarf? I said dwarves. Got it. So Chris, <laughs> Team Wolf. Chris. <laughs> so Chris, yeah. for Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Yeah. All right. What would be uh, uh, an adult concept or idea that you would add in, like a modern day concept or idea that you would add into Snow White in order to kind of tweak it and update it a little bit along the lines Boy. of what we saw tonight? Uh... We're going to come back to you. Yeah, come back to me. Joe, Pinocchio, Mm -hmm. how with all of the lying and and everything that's involved in all the Italian, how would you... So Pinocchio becomes friends with a black musician. Oh, my God. Right. (laughs) Fuck you. (laughs) No. uh, So uh, specifically for Pinocchio, I mean, uh, the, 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 the two most obvious things are one, his nose grows when he lies, right? So that's a porn. And then, um, <laughs> you know, and then you got like the like, you know, lie to me, lie to me, lie to me. Um, and then what? Am I the bad guy? No. It's, uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> no. Uh, Pinocchio grows up and, and, uh, and, and runs for public office and his nose is huge and nobody seems to give a shit. Uh, okay. Uh, and it's a, it's a scathing commentary on modern politics. There you go. So oh, I like it. I like it. Yeah. Chris. I don't know. Maybe uh, she wakes up. Fast. She doesn't need the uh, the rape fantasy need, that is the oh my unconscious God. woman. What? That's what that is. I thought that's where we were going. <laughs> no? Okay. No. Well, that's no, the she real just wakes story. Up, she just, you know, like, She's in a coma. She, yeah, like, cause, making cause out with a girl in a coma. That's sex I guess assault. That she literally wakes up like a minute into the thing. And then I would add, a, uh, you know, one of the dwarves is 6'5". Uh, it's and, the biggest you know, dwarf ever. Yeah. And... um. He, and he sound nobody wants anything to do with him, and he goes on to star in the uh, National Basketball League and comes oh, back, and then he's the the one true hope for her. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Way to think I do through. have right. like Understood. like Jack and the Beanstalk. I was thinking like halfway through the Beanstalk itself crumbles because of global climate change. There you go. Yeah. Right? There That's you go. A, Perfect. And, uh, also, the cops else. come because Jack's obviously breaking into this dude's fucking house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gets a gets a B and E right away. Yeah. Yeah. You know? uh, I wanted to then kind of ask is like the final question that I had for this. There was a moment that we had where uh, Grimmy is kind of like shooting through the sky at one point, and uh, in, in, there comes a reference where it says "Eat at Joe's," and so uh, this is like a very nuanced, very like kind of deep dig cartoon reference. Uh, and it was interesting and surprising for me because I actually had to do a little bit of research to figure out what some of this was. Did you guys know what it was about? Not until I did the research. Okay, all right. If I'm honest, I was going to pretend yeah. like I did. Uh, Joe, you want to take this for two, uh, one thousand for no notable so he, Eat at Joe references? I I don't know this actually. Um, there used to be a restaurant in Manhattan called Eat, Eat Joe's or whatever like that. Um, okay. So like you would see signs there that said eat at Joe's. It was like a real diner called Joe's and they used to have signs that said eat at Joe's. I don't know if that's a play on an older joke that I don't know about. So it was an old Tex Avery 
like cartoon that they had with where the wolf and stuff. It was uh, with a bear that had okay. a sandwich board over top of him that said "Eat It, Joe's." It was from an older cartoon that they had that was called uh, I think it was Jerky Turkey. Mm-hmm. And so they had a they had a reference or like an allusion to this of just kind of the sandwich board hmm. uh, that had was like one of the first like "Eat It, Joe's." And then by the end of it, something happens in the cartoon. I won't give away any spoilers, but they say basically like "Don't eat it, Joe's." Uh, kind of is like a, a rebuttal to the commentary that they have in it, and so it's 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 a very like weird, old school like Tex Avery reference that they just kind of like snuck in, which I, you don't see that very often. It was very. But but my question is this: Was there a Joe's, the titular Joe's, that the Tex Avery cartoon is spoofing? And that's of? what I need to do a little bit more research but, on. Yeah. Was it something that was influenced by the place that was in Manhattan or not? What I saw when I saw that the, the name Eat at Joe's was a you know it was a fictional name given to all restaurants, the mm-hmm. Every Man's Restaurant. It's you sort of like, like Joe Six Packs Restaurant, yeah. right? It's so sort of it was, like in Looney Tunes, like when you say like uh, you know when Wiley e. Coyote would order something and it always came from Acme, right? It's like the generic. Yeah. Right type of thing. It's a that safe they way had. to kind yeah. of get around. It's like an easy way. And then the restaurant probably got named after that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. The re- the reference in that second one with the ham or the uh, yeah that I loved was when they knocked down the straw house. Oh, oh. and the, and he goes, now I know how Ray I can't think Bolger of Ray Bolger felt. <laughs> And Ray thought, Bolger played this the Scarecrow, the Scarecrow in, the in the Wizard of, Wizard of Oz, Oz. Right, right? And I was just like, "Oh man, that's really smart." Yeah, it's Loved weird. It. It's weird because there's like very smart. The second one was much better than there. the first one. I enjoyed it. Yeah, the second one was much better. Yeah. So, although I did enjoy the uh, "Tell me how to get to Sesame Street," because he's like one. That was such a. Well, if I get one of those canaries, I can eat for weeks or something like that. And I was just <laughs> like, "Oh, you're joking about murdering Big Bird." <laughs> like that's dark. I like it. So. Oh man. All right. Well. We obviously have our opinions, and we're going to get to them in a moment. But first, we're going to turn this over to longtime friend and listener of the show, Bobby Anthem, for this week's Bobby, Love It or Hate It. Bobby. Bobby. Bobby, take it away. This week's Love It is titled, Just As Great As The Garfield and Friends Show, by The Walk 129 in July 2010. It's edited for length, and it says... I still remember this being among the various Saturday morning cartoons that aired and I watched when I was little and younger. I've always loved this and it has always been on my favorite animated shows list. I believe it falls into the same league as Garfield and Friends as far as humor goes, and the first thing viewers who are new to this cartoon will immediately notice is that both share the same animation style. Those two things are what both have in common. I can't say which I still like even more, because I think they're great equally. Yet another classic but rare tune that fell by the wayside too soon in its run, and also considering it hasn't been on the air since it stopped airing on CBS. It could introduce some airtime again in place of any inferior program that's airing currently. However, months ago I became reacquainted with the show again after finding it on, what else, YouTube was reminded of the title and saw some of the episodes. All who would be checking this out for the first time should do the same and view these right now. If it's possible, please. It's part of the better ones than some certain rubbish that passes for shows. Underrated deserves to be brought back from Oblivion and to DVD. 10 out of 10. And our Hate It, which is really not a Hate It, is titled, It Was Funny, The Cat Was the Best Part, by Gazelle28 in February 2005. This one is edited for length and clarity, and it says, The cat looked like a fuzzy catfish, all head and tail. Funny Marvin the Martian voice, and you had to love that Eddie Deason voiced big. Some good stuff here, Dr. Seuss poof. Mitzi What's-Her-Name as the Goose, Arnold as the Terminator type as the Idiot Dog Catcher, etc. Very much a part of its times and done without any of the unnecessary Ren and Stimpy type poo humor that invaded the airwaves at the time. It's weird that this hasn't been out on video or come back yet in repeats. It is a funny tune. Mike Peter stuff tends to be pretty hit or miss, Both on TV and in the papers, he's very slapstick, and the humor is broad. Here they seem to distill it just right. I say give it a shot if you ever see it. 
three X's out of four stars. It's very interesting that, you know, for, we didn't have a lot of reviews for this show. It feels like a lot of people maybe slept on this or, or don't really remember, or don't really kind of like seek it out. It's only a few episodes, very short two seasons. Um, and so that in mind, people really seemed to, to still very much enjoy maybe just the cartoon in general, but also, you know, or maybe they enjoyed the comic strip in general, but they really seemed to like the cartoon as well. So it's almost like we had two love it's back to back instead of a love it and a hate it. So always interesting to see it when that happens. But let's get into our final review. So for anybody joining us for the first time, we can recommend something and say why, or we can not recommend something and we can give an explanation. If we don't recommend something, we can go one step further and we can give the show the dip. And if we have a majority vote on the dip, that means it erases it from the annals of cartoon history. And so Chris, Mother Goose and Grimm, so, recommend or not? So like looking at that whole episode as one episode or two episodes? Yeah, yeah. Let's right? look at it as, as one holistic piece. Well, I guess I would say, rep- uh, I would say, uh, yeah, I would watch it. You know, I, I would recommend it. Yes. Okay. You know, it's interesting, the storyline in it, the ultimate outcome. Yeah, I, I would like to see them get there a little faster. I love the elements that we, t- we talked about, everybody from the fleas to the, but I enjoy the second one mostly because of the tilt on that story. Uh, and how, where they took it in that different, I think it's kind of a precursor to some of what we see much more in adult, you know, co- uh, cartoons I would watch on Netflix or something like that. So I would say it's, you know, worth a view. Would I go out of my way? Maybe not. But I mean, if it was there, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it the no way, don't waste your time. Right. Huh. Understood. Joe. Uh, I'm not going to recommend it, but I'm not going to give it the dip. I feel like this was a good starter kit um in for like an eek the cat or the far superior Rocco's modern life yeah yeah which is also the same the same guys um i feel like this is a decent like jumping off point for them um but it's it's early and it's not as focused as as laser focused as those other shows are uh so you know it's a it's a kid show i mean obvious not obviously because it's a cartoon but like if, at the time period when it was it was Built for kids. Uh, I wouldn't go out of my way to show it to my kids, but I wouldn't be upset if they were watching it, so I'm not going to give it the dip. Right. You know, I, I think that there's part of me, and I'm really on the fence with this, you know, uh, and, and I think it actually helped through the discussion tonight. I'm, I'm going to recommend it, um, but it's not like a glowing recommendation. It's sort of along the lines of what Ulrich had said that, you know, I would recommend it, but I'm also not going to go out of my way to find this. Um it's interesting, you know, kind of in the conversation and discussion that we had tonight, like I felt like there was some smart things that they added and peppered in every once in a while. Like there were weird things like the... It had potential. Yeah, it had a lot of potential. And I wonder if over the next 12 episodes, if it sort of builds into some of that potential. The challenge that we always get from people, you know, when they listen is that they're just like, well, you made a snap decision based on one episode. And yeah, we are. We're, that's 100% what we're doing. I'm not going to argue with you there. That's the whole conceit of this podcast. If you don't like that now, you're not going to like 232 other episodes of this show. Uh, you know, and so just kind of getting into it, like, I think I would recommend this. And I, I'm glad that I had a chance to kind of go back and remember and recap some of this. But it's definitely not a cartoon that I think I'm going to, you know, go out and, and try to find. And I think, Joe, you said it perfectly. Like, this is a great jumping off point for a lot of these people to to put some of these things in well there. Uh, plus, you know, what? I always love things that like pull in more modern day fairy tales and fables. I think those always have a lot of potential. I think there's always a lot of potential fun to kind of see how you can modernize something and make it relatable to an audience, but also still have an appeal to a kid that's watching that. I think that that's not challenging. I mean, like we had stuff that we were watching tonight that was, you know, hey, your your house for the three little pigs has been zoned in properly. <laughs> You know, and he's and we have like somebody from the city <laughs> handing out, you know, like decrees that they need to get rid of these these houses. And so it's a weird thing. And it's as a kid, character. I and as a kid, I probably would have watched it and been like, I don't really get that joke. But right. like as an adult, I'm like, OK, that's kind of funny. Like right. they're playing kinda, more a broader audience. Yeah, I kind of like that. And I, I, I wouldn't have gotten that had I not like if I was a child, I would not have gotten that joke. I'm only kind of getting that and realizing it now as an adult. And so I kind of appreciate that it was playing on a couple different levels. Big time. Yeah. So. I think that's one of the cool things about your podcast is that you dig into that world a little bit and bring this out, you know, 
for like looking back when we were kids, looking at this now, looking at it through the lens as, as, as adults and seeing how we, what can we learn from these? What can we pull from these? So I love that you do this. Thank you, Chris. I will give you the $20 that I owe you for, <laughs> for saying that on the way. I just have a question for Joe though. You okay. Know? Yeah. Yeah. I just, when Grimmy's going through the garbage and like when you were on the streets, mm. was, there, <laughs> was there a strong bond? Did you feel like, you know, like the connection you, between when the you, two? When you were trying to kiss uh, the girl, uh, and you were on your omnibus pulled by horses. <laughs> um, <laughs> was the sound of the clopping like distracting? It was. So yeah. like if it was, that. yeah. So when you were, was there any garbage that you liked grabbing more than right. any other garbage? Well, you know, the Big Macs because they were in the styrofoam <laughs> containers. Could really make a meal out of that whole thing. Oh, oh my God. God. I'm just glad you found a home and you've pulled yeah. it together since yeah, then. Well, and... Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm also glad that you could both be on the show tonight. <laughs> So thank you both. I want to go around and Chris, uh, anything that you have pr to promote and where can the people find you on social media? Uh, well, yeah, in terms of uh, Jive Turkey, which I'm fortunate, lucky enough to do with this guy sitting to my right, Joe Randazzo. Uh, we're uh, doing a bunch of, sh an interesting kind of format coming up on April 3rd, no, April 5th, April 5th. And Whatever the Sunday is. Yeah, so, and I think the 19th, we're at uh, Bus Boys and Poets in Shirlington with, um, uh, the, the uh, doing opera. We're doing. We're going to play with these folks that do urban opera, okay. and then we're going to improvise off of them. And uh, and in terms of my the rest of me personally, you can find me at www.cu the letter cu in the moment dot com, uh, where I talk about and live um, and do a lot of stuff on body language and its effects, uh, both political and other folks in our community in our world. And uh, it's what I part of my world I teach. And you can find me also at DC Improv, where I teach improv. And also, again, perform with, uh, with Joe Randazzo here as part of Jive Turkey. And then I'm also fortunate enough to, to play with uh, Knox. We have we got a show on Friday. And then every Friday uh, during the Fist Run, you can check that we out. We had a with, show on Saturday, buddy. We have a show on Saturday? We had a show on Saturday. Right, we, that, have a, when, we, have a, we have upcoming shows on. Well, when by the time this comes out, it's Sunday. Yeah, that's what I was It'll thinking. be Sunday. Sunday. So next week, anyway. But during the Fist Run at WitDC.com, you can find Knox. Dot org. That'll work. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you have going on? Where can the good people find you? Uh, so I'm working with Jive Turkey. Uh, I'm also working with Sistine Robot. Uh, we are doing the Double Date. Uh, double Date is the, uh, the fist winning. Um, <clears throat> fist is a local improv competition. Uh, on April 14th, we're doing the Double Date show. Uh, and then I am actually, uh, I was... I've created and am directing and producing a dramatic improv show um, for the Fringe Festival uh, called The Heist, uh, and it is going to be going up in July. Uh, it is a dramatic uh, scene uh, improv show based on, uh, loosely based on Dog Day Afternoon, and it's going to be about a bank, robbage and a, a bank robbery and a hostage situation. So laughs abound. Uh, so come check that out. One other thing I forgot is that uh, I'm also doing a show with Sean Westfall over at uh, Unified, and okay. it's called Frenemies, where we we take a look at, at the lens of ridiculous issues through um, oh, Gore Vidal's great. eyes and William F. Buckley. Perfect. So, you know, liberal versus conservative. Yeah, uh, uh, liberal versus conservative, and uh, we'll take a look at like why is a hot dog a sandwich, and we, you know, we argue it as though we were talking about. Uh, some political topic between conservatives and Democrats. Perfect. So what were you going to say? We're also, uh, a bunch of us, uh, I think all oh, yeah. three of us are yeah. doing the Jason Sign show yeah. Yeah. Um, on April 3rd, 3rd. Mm -hmm. um, at WIT. Uh, if you don't know who he is, he, is a, he was a local improviser, DC improviser, uh, who was out in LA and unfortunately got very hurt um, and is battling back from a pretty traumatic uh, injury. Uh, so that show is going to be on April 3rd. It's going to be in New York, DC and LA. Uh, so please look that up, um, and come and support and, and help him out. Yeah. yeah and if there's, absolutely. yeah, and if you can't come, you could still support him. Uh, you know, he's got some serious legal or, um, not legal, medical uh, bills, medical bills yeah. that are over like 300 grand. Yeah. And so, you know, anything we can do to help him out, it's yeah. be starter. Absolutely. Good, starter, good guy. Good and we're going to post all of these in the show notes. So people have these awesome show. and make them accessible as well. So you guys heard him on tonight's episode, our friend of the show, Bobby Anthem. He is on Twitter at Bobby Anthem. Send him a message, show him some love. He is simply the best. 
As for me, I perform with an improv group that's called Knox. That's N-O-X exclamation point. We perform with Washington Improv Theater. You can find tickets and times with dc.org. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Paul Ellis. Want to support this little show? Tell a friend. Review us on Apple iTunes. Slide into our DMs on Twitter at Morning Tunes. Remember, that's morning with a U. You can check us out on Instagram and Facebook at Saturday Morning Cartoons. Drop us an old-fashioned email, SaturdayMorningCartoons at gmail.com. You can find all of the links that we've talked about tonight on our link tree, which is in the bio for every single one of our social media sites. And as always, you can find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, wherever fine podcasts are sold. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll be back in two weeks. Hey, everybody. Thanks a lot for listening to Saturday Morning Cartoons. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to transform and roll out.